in the previous video, we had a look at the background and the backdrop to equity. And in this video, we're going to move from that background to the current approaches to equity and some of the equitable maxims that underlie, underlie equity itself. So let's get straight into it. So conscionability is the underlying principle in equity and this has seen something of a revival recently and it was said in the Islington case that equity operates on the conscience of the owner of the legal interest. In the case of a trust the conscience of the legal owner requires him to carry out the purposes for which the property was vested in him, express or implied trust, or which the law imposes on him by reason of his unconscionable conduct, the constructive trust. So this case was one of the most important cases in relation to the development of equity and the trust in recent years. It's from 1996. And Lord Brown Wilkinson here reasserted a traditional understanding of the trust as being based on the conscience of the person who acts as a trustee. Now, so the basis of the the trust and indeed the whole of equity is concerned with regulating the conscience of a person where the common law might otherwise allow that person to act unconscionably but in accordance with the letter of the law. For example, if the statute or the common law said that red-headed people could receive a payment of money, if the defendant wore a red wig, the common law may permit that defendant to keep the money on a literal interpretation of the rule. However, equity would prevent the defendant from manipulating that statute for fraudulent purposes on the basis that to allow the defendant to do so would be unconscionable. So this case, the Islington case, reasserts the basic principle of good conscience. What is conscionability? Since the Earl of Oxford case in 1615, it has been clear that equity operates on the basis of identifying and judging the conscience of the defendant. Now, to some, the idea of conscience is too vague and subjective to be useful, but this is a misunderstanding of how conscience works. See, all of the great psychoanalysts, such as Freud, considered the conscience to be something that operates outside the conscience mind conscious mind. So if you think about it, the conscience is that still small voice which speaks to us, mainly of shame, which we have no conscious control of. Instead, the conscience is the product of a lifetime of receiving messages from other people, you know, like your parents, your family, your teachers, etc. And throughout life, we receive messages about what is acceptable and what is unacceptable conduct. And the conscience is therefore something which is formed in reaction to these outside forces, even though our individual consciences are experiences inside our own minds. We might say that the conscience is objectively constituted, i.e. it's formed in reaction to an external stimuli, even though it's subjectively situated in that we experience it within our own minds. So, in essence, the court is assessing which messages the conscience should have absorbed and consequently which sorts of behaviours are suitable for judgment. So when a court of equity acts on the conscience of the defendant, that is what it is doing. It is holding the defendant up to the objective standard of good conscience and those standards of good conscience are contained in the principles of equity for the most part. So as just stated, Conscience is an objective measure. It does not matter what the legal owner regards his conduct as acceptable. The Lord Chancellor was the keeper of the king's conscience and not the conscience of the defendant. Conscionability may be invoked by fraud, dishonesty, misrepresentation, mistake, breach of duty, breach of trust or confidence, breach of promise or representation, conflict of interest, abuse of position, undue influence or assisting or knowing of any of these factors. So any of these matters may be examples of the defendant acting unconscionably. And we have the fiduciary relationship too. So a fiduciary relationship is a relationship of trust and confidence which imposes a greater degree of responsibility on the person bound by it 
than either contract or tort. In particular, a person under a fiduciary obligation is obliged to act in the best interests of the beneficiary, if necessary, adversely to their own interest. This principle has been strictly applied in cases of conflict of interest, as we see in the Boardman and Phipps case. So, so in these relationships, such as those between a trustee and a beneficiary, the law demands a higher than ordinary degree of care and responsibility for the dominant trusted party, so the trustee in this example. So and in Boardman and Phipps, we have a solicitor um, for a trust fund noticed a significant opportunity in the accounts of the company and he utilised this opportunity with the knowledge of some of the trustees making a significant profit for both the trustees and himself and he used this information um, for his, so he had used this information for his own personal profit which breached his uh, fiduciary obligations not to make any unauthorised profit. <clears throat> so that's a little bit about where we're at right now. And these are the sort of concepts of the fiduciary relationship and stuff like that. We'll dive into further in this video series on equity and trusts. And but for now, we're going to look at the equitable maxims. So there are quite a few different ones and we're going to try and look at them in turn. So we've got equity will not suffer a wrong to be without a remedy. Equity follows the law. Where there is equal equity, the law shall prevail. Where the equities are equal, the first in time shall prevail. Delay defeats equity. He who seeks equity must do equity. He who comes to equity must come with clean hands. Equality is equity. Equity looks to the intent rather to, than to the form. Equity looks on as done uh, that which ought to have been done. Equity imputes an intention to fulfil an obligation. Equity acts in personum. Equity not, will, will not permit the law to be used as an engine of fraud. Equity will not allow a trustee to take benefit from the property. Equity will not assist a volunteer. Equity does not act in vain. A trust operates on the conscience of the legal owner of the property and a bona fide purchaser for value without notice is equity's darling. Now we're going to look at some of these equitable maxims in the course of this video, uh, but you may recognize some of them already. For example, this last one here about the bona fide purchaser for value without notice is equity's darling. We would have looked at that during the land law video. So make sure you check that one out, but you should recognize that equitable maxim already. But if not, don't worry, we're gonna go through some of them now. So these are not binding rules, but guiding principles. And you can see Tinsley and Milligan, for example, um, for example, where the defendant attempted to rely on the maxim, he who comes to equity must come with clean hands, but the maxim was not followed. At one time, the maxims of equity were regarded as the fundamental principles of equity on which the whole of the equitable jurisdiction was based. This view has long since been abandoned and they are best regarded now as rules to be, uh, sorry, not as rules to be literally applied, but as indicators of the approach that equity takes to particular problems. Now in Tinsley, the claimant had done something fraudulent um, and Tinsley claimed benefits saying that the house belonged to his partner and she paid the rent and so there was an argument who, who about who owned the house and the defendant tried to rely on the maxim above relying on her inequitable behavior but the house of laws did not follow the maxim and allowed the claimant to have the house itself but yeah, so that's a little bit about Tinsley so let's have a look at some of these equitable maxims just so that we can get a better understanding of how they work and how they operate. And this is the sort of things that will be applied and thought about during any case involving equity. So equity will not suffer a wrong to be without a remedy. This is at the heart of the equitable jurisdiction. Where the common law fails or the remedy of damages is inadequate, equity has developed a number of equitable remedies to address the particular situation. And these include injunctions. So in that sense, equity will not allow a wrong to be committed without there being some sort of remedy to address it. And equity will intervene in circumstances in which there is no apparent remedy, but where the court is of the view that justice demands that there be some ready, a remedy made available to the claimant. For example, under a trust, a beneficiary has no right at common law 
to have the terms of the trust enforced, but the court will nevertheless require a trustee to carry out those terms to prevent her committing what would be in effect a wrong against the beneficiary. And we've got equity follows the law, so equity cannot overrule statute, and equity will not overrule the common law unless there is unconscionability. However, where there is a conflict between an existing principle in equity and a common law rule, the principle of equity will prevail. So that's just, I think that's pretty straightforward and doesn't really require much explanation. Where there is equal um, equity, the law shall prevail. So in, in a situation in which there is no clear distinction to be drawn between parties as to which of them has a better claim in equity, the common law principle which best fits the case is applied. In that sense, where the equitable doctrine produces an equal result, then the common law will prevail. For example, in circumstances where two people have both purported to purchase goods from a fraudulent vendor of those goods for the same price, neither of them would have a better claim to the goods in equity. Therefore, the ordinary common rules of commercial law would be applied in that context. Where the equities are equal, the first in time shall prevail. So where two claimants have equally strong case cases, equity will favour the person who acquired their rights first. In that sense, the first in time prevails. So for example, if two equitable mortgagees, so two banks, each seek to enforce their security rights under the mortgage ahead of the other mortgagee, the court will give priority to the person who created their mortgage first. Delay defeats equity. So this refers to the equitable doctrine of latches, which is an equitable form of limitation. So this means that too much delay will prevent access to equitable remedy. The underpinning of the principle is that if a claimant allows too much time to elapse between the facts giving rise to a claim and the service of proceedings to protect that claim, the court will not protect her rights. The doctrine of not allowing the inequitable remedy where there has been unconscionable delay is known as latches. Whether too much time has elapsed, elapsed will depend on the particular case. However, as equity follows the law, the Limitation Act 1980 prevails. So the Limitation Act will normally apply to time bar actions, but if there is no limitation, then the equitable doctrine of latches will apply. And you can look at the William and Central Bank of Nigeria case if you want to, but this is something that I will explain later in the video series, rather than now, because it's not that important to explaining the maxims. He who seeks equity must do equity, so a claimant will not receive the court's support unless she has acted entirely fairly herself. Therefore, in relation to injunctions, for example, the court will award an injunction to an applicant during litigation, only where that would be fair to the respondent and where the applicant herself undertakes to carry out her own obligations under a court judgment. And a court of equity will not act in favour of someone who has, for example, committed an illegal act. He who comes to equity must have come with clean hands, so a person must not have acted improperly or unconscionably if she is seeing, uh, seeking an equitable remedy. As a development of the previous principle of fairness, an applicant for an equitable remedy will not receive that remedy where she has not acted equitably herself. So, for example, an applicant will not be entitled to an order of specific performance of a lease, that is to get someone to perform the lease, if that applicant is already in breach of a material term of that lease, which would mean the other person has already been treated detrimentally by the applicant. So the principle means that you cannot act hypocritically to ask for equitable relief when you're not acting equitably, equitably yourself. And this and the previous doctrine are related to the fact that an equitable claim cannot be founded on the Conscionable conduct of the claim, unconscionable conduct of the claimant. The first refers to the future conduct of the claimant, while the second refers to their previous conduct. In either case, the illegal or inequitable conduct must be related to the claim.
equality is equity, so where both parties have an equitable interest, there is a presumption that the interests are equal in the absence of reasons otherwise. For example, where there is a trust of a family home, there'll be a presumption that the shares are equal. Okay. Equity looks to the intent rather than to the form, so equity will look to the intent of the parties rather than the words used. This has been used to create a trust where there is clear intention, even if the word trust has not been used. So you can create a trust if there is intention to do so, even if the words used would not normally be adequate to form a trust. It is a common principle of English law that the courts will seek to look through any artifice and give effect to the substance of any transaction rather than merely to its surface appearance. So in Paul and Constance, even though the parties do not use the expression trust, the court was willing to give effect to something which is in substance a trust. And therefore they would make that into a trust and will strike down supposed trusts which are merely shams as we'll see in Midland Bank and Wyatt in 1995. Equity looks on as done that which ought to have been done. So where there is an obligation, for example, a binding agreement to create a lease, the court will deem that the, obli will deem that the obligation has been performed in equity, even if not binding in law. So the courts will consider that something has been done if the court believes that it ought to have been done. For example, in Walsh and Lonsdale, where a binding contract to grant an, um, a lease was deemed to create an equitable lease, even though the formal requirements to create a valid common law lease had not been observed. The rationale behind equity finding that there was a lease which could be effective was the principle that the landlord was bound by specific performance to carry out his obligations under the contract and to grant a formally valid lease to the tenant. Therefore, it was held the landlord ought to have granted such a lease in the Walsh and Lonsdale case. In the eyes of equity, then, the grant of the lease was something which ought to have been done and which could therefore be deemed in equity to have been done with the result that a lease was created in equity. Equity imputes an intention to fulfil an obligation. Where an act is performed, though not expressed as being in fulfilment of an obligation, equity will hold that the act is in fulfilment of that obligation. For example, where a person leaves money to a creditor, it will be presumed that the legacy is in settlement of the debt and the creditor cannot sue the estate for the debt. Another example would be if a deceased woman had owed a money debt to a man before her death and left money to that man in her will, equity would presume that the money left in the will was left in satisfaction of the debt owed to that man. This presumption could be rebutted by some cogent evidence to the contrary, for example, that the money legacy had been promised long before the debt arose. And the last one we're going to look at is equity acts in personam. And this is a key feature of equity, meaning that a court of equity is concerned to prevent any given individual from acting unconscionably. Equity's jurisdiction was always exercised against the person and the judgments bind the defendant. The guiding, the guiding principle of conscionability means that only the person whose conscience is or should be affected is bound. Accordingly, the court's decision could not be enforceable in rem against the world. In other words, it is the defendant's conscience being tested and therefore their conscience will be bound. The Court of Equity therefore makes an order based on the facts of an individual case to prevent that particular defendant from continuing to act unconscionably. In each situation, the underlying objective of the court is to make the defendant act in good conscience by observing the trust, by refraining from taking property out of the jurisdiction and so on. If that person does not refrain, she will be in contempt of court. And that equity acts in personam does not mean that it awards purely personal rights, such as such as damages at common law, as opposed to proprietary rights, because equity also awards proprietary rights in the form of rights under trust, etc. This particular use of in personam refers back to Lord Ellesmere's description of equity in the Earl of Oxford case as being concerned with the conscience of the defendant who appears before the court.
In this sense, equity is concerned with the person's particular good behaviour and thus with what their conscience should have told them. Okay, so I think this wraps up the introductory videos into equity and trust. We've looked at the background now, we've looked at our understanding of conscionability and the current approaches to equity and some of the equitable maxims. In the next video, we're going to dive into the trust itself. I will give a little bit of a background story into trusts and how trusts have arisen in their own personal context. So we looked at the history of equity, we're going to look at the history of trust for a little bit before diving into what trusts exist, the modern trust and so on. So make sure you subscribe to my channel because you don't want to miss that video and give this one a like and also if you have any questions at all just leave them below and I'll get straight back to you. Thank you very much for watching.